Hey everybody, it's Gregory Unruh and welcome to the fifth and final video in our series on geomimicry. So in the last video we discussed how our reliance on geomimicry is actually reversing hundreds of millions of years of geological and biological activity, activity that dramatically reduced the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now the question is what to do about it. Obviously keeping new carbon from getting into the atmosphere in the first place is the most efficient and cheapest way to keep global warming from getting worse. And so one possibility then is to turn away from geomimicry and start to do things the way nature does. Take a biomimetic approach to manufacturing instead of a geomimetic one. I talk about this route extensively in my book, The Biosphere Rules, which lays out a set of manufacturing principles that are derived from nature that can eliminate most of the unfortunate consequences of geomimicry. However, even if we were able to apply biomimicry today, it would only deal with future emissions. What about the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere? How are we gonna get rid of that? Well, there are a variety of op uh, uh, approaches, um, but one of these is actually to double down on geomimicry. Now, I know that sounds strange. I said geomimicry is the root of many of our sustainability problems, but given the situation we're in, um, doubling down on our emulation of geological processes may be a way in which we can tackle the challenges of global warming. And this is captured, these techniques are captured in this idea of geoengineering, which is a deliberate intervention in planetary systems to mitigate climate change. What we're really trying to do is hack into Earth's processes and mimic these planetary scale geological processes to help uh, return climatic conditions to uh, conditions that are more you know conducive to you know humans and our in our in our lifestyle so one simple approach is to you know mim mimic or simulate the impact of volcanic activity on the climate heat in the atmosphere comes primarily from the sun the sunlight enters the atmosphere it's transparent to, uh, to sunlight and then it hits the surface of the earth and then is turned into heat and then heat actually is trapped by the atmosphere so you can think of the, the, your car in a, parked in the parking lot in the sun, sunlight goes through the windscreen uh, easily, strikes your black leather seats and then gets turned into heat. That heat then can escape through the windshield and it gets trapped inside. That's the way the atmosphere works. And so one option is like putting, uh, uh, parking your car in the shade, for example. Uh, what we can do is put a, a, a a screen, you know, a sunscreen up into the stratosphere to limit the amount of sunlight getting in. And volcanic eruptions do this naturally. When you have a volcanic eruption, it puts a lot of dust up into the stratosphere that shields the earth from sunlight. And the difference is measurable. You know, we can measure the heat balance of the atmosphere from keeping the sun out or by letting it in. Now, thanks to geomimicry, we're inadvertently doing this already. Airplanes flying through the air when they combust uh, the fuel, they lead these contrails, these, these streams that, they, that uh, go through. And those actually add up. Science can actually measure the impact of, these, uh, of sort of the umbrella that they create and the amount of sunlight they reflect and uh, doesn't reach, uh, reach the ground. And we can figure out how much cooling we get from putting that stuff in the atmosphere. And after the 9-11 attacks, when all the airplanes were grounded, uh, it gave it a really good opportunity for scientists to measure the amount of temperature uh, increase or decrease that uh, these contrails are putting these putting the, these particles up in the uh, up in the stratosphere uh, uh, get from reducing the amount of sunlight coming in. And what we can do is engineer clouds uh, or vo volcanic eruptions of our own. We can begin to put into the atmosphere. Uh, uh, materials, little particles that will actually reflect the sunlight and begin then to mimic the effect of a volcanic eruption on the earth and cool down the planet. Right, so that's a one simple approach. We begin to, to shade the atmosphere and that's something that we can be can be done now if we, if we were, were inclined. Uh, geoengineers say they have the technology to, to do that today. Okay, well that will keep, that one way is, you know, f Im imitate what the what, what geology does, it keeps the sun, uh, sun's energy from reaching the earth. The other is we can mimic uh, the way geology and biology remove CO2 from the atmosphere. In the last video, we talked about how biology and geology work together to sequester CO2. Plants grow, they become buried, and they're turned into coal, and all of the carbon that was in the tree and in the plant is then sequestered underground. And, you know, the idea is 
doing replicating this and so that we can sort of hack into the carbon cycle and, and um, begin to mimic what biology and 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 geology does can we emulate that process so geology are, as we said is already doing this one way to do uh, geomimicry is is accelerate the weathering process so certain silicate rocks like you know volcanic basalt or something are rich in calcium and magnesium and what happens that mineral reacts with rainwater and 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 the atmosphere and it draws carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and it turns it into carbonate and bicarbonate minerals and these minerals are relatively stable and they can stay in the soil and they can become long-term carbon sinks um, so we could do this right away. We could crush up uh, large quantities of these rocks and spread them out uh, even in agricultural fields and begin to count on biology to, I mean, sorry, geology to start sequestering away some of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The challenge, of course, is the cost of crushing and distributing these rocks across uh, the globe in a you know, program of enhanced weathering. Um, but that is something we can do now. Of course, as we mentioned, geology is, is relatively slow. It's a slow process compared to biology. Biology works at a much faster rate. And uh, we saw that when you combine biology and geology to, together, they can take out large quantities of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, and sequester it away. So one possibility is to grow more forests. You know, if we were to plant more forests and make sure that those trees did not get uh, burned or something, we could actually use the forest growth to sequester larger quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere. But there are limits to that. Um, and it requires vast tracts of land, uh, which, it, which is a challenge. So another possibility is to mimic uh, processes like that. And, and technologists are proposing something like you'd see here, which is sort of a giant atmospheric vacuum cleaner. And there are you know, university scientists, uh, government scientists, and even commercial companies that are building technology to do just that. The, these, these systems pass the atmosphere uh, over a variety of different systems that actually suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere and either turn it into concentrated carbon dioxide gas or carbonate minerals. And after you do that, then what you would want to do is you need to get rid of that uh, captured CO2. And so you put it, give it back to geology. You pump it back down into geologic formations like old gas reservoirs or old oil wells. And you are then sort of simulating uh, these, this combination of, uh, of, of bio and geomimicry to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, sequester it away, put it back where it came from before we started yanking it out of the ground. So there are a number of these geomimetic approaches, this, these geoengineering approaches that allow us to um, influence and alter the, the chemistry of the atmosphere. Uh, but we need to be careful. You know, we've been unconsciously altering, uh, altering the atmosphere by our use of fossil fuels and the release of CO2 in the atmosphere. But that's been unconscious. Now what we're talking about is consciously beginning to do that. It's, it's purposeful. It's a different level of action. And we're engaging in a way in, in planetary engineering that we've, we've never done before. And there's a cautionary tale I learned. Uh, and that is that managing an atmosphere is really hard. When I was on faculty at Columbia University, the college was managing the Biosphere 2, which was this um, scientific installation built in the Arizona desert where scientists wanted to replicate Biosphere 1, which is the biosphere in which we live. They wondered, could we replicate the ecosystems of the planet's systems in a con closed, contained environment such that it would create life-sustaining conditions and maintain life-sustaining conditions over long periods of time. And this was seen as sort of the first step to colonizing planets like Mars. If we were going to go to another planet, we would need to be able to create life-sustaining conditions. So the idea was there would be these various ecosystems underneath this giant glass um, you know, terrarium uh, that would... Um, you know, maintain a safe level of oxygen that would naturally uh, clean and purify water and be capable of producing food. So, you know, you can talk to the scientists and some of the biospherians that were involved in this and they tell you, well, if, you know, if, if we wanted to, we could, we got another shot at it, we could, we could be much more successful than we were with the first time we tried to build Biosphere 2. But you get kind of a different exp uh, experience when you talk to the people that actually lived inside the biosphere. There were actually a team of biospherians that lived inside the biosphere too uh, for, for a year. 
and they tell you a very different story. Um, they call it, they say that it was a year of starving and suffocating. You know, the systems by which that we get for free in Biosphere One were very hard to maintain. It was hard to get the level of oxygen such that it was at a at a healthy concentration. So people were not getting enough oxygen in the air they they were breathing, and it was much also much more difficult to have maintain systems that were successful in producing big enough quantities of food. And so they were always um, short on food. Um, so it, it turns out, and this is a relatively s simple experiment, you know, we're not, we're, we're inside, granted it was a very large facility, but it's, you know, it's nothing compared to trying to manage the biosphere one in which we live. So unfortunately, our, our success as a species and our e emphasis on geomimicry has gotten us to a point where um, this is an unavoidable question. What we're talking about now is consciously taking the wheel of Spaceship Earth. It's, an, it's really an existential uh, shift for, for human beings and for humanities. You know, and, and we're actually talking about getting to the point where we're going to choose the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere and you know, decide what level it should be at. And obviously, you know, what level should it be at? That's a huge question. You know, some regions maybe in the north might like greater levels of CO2 because it makes it warmer or, you know, certain growing regions might want to lower CO2 because it reduces the amount of uh, drought and, and heat. You know, there's, there's the question about what it should be set at um, and what kind of planet do we want to manage. Those are questions that humanity has never considered and ones probably we're not ready for yet. But ready or not, we are unwittingly doing it. We are already transforming the climate. We're reversing the great sequestration. And we know now we need to halt that and probably reverse it. Um, and we're going to have to have to deal with and confront these amazing uh, existential questions we are going to have to ask ourselves as a species and, and a race. All right, it's un unescapable. And as Marshall McLuhan, the, the great... Uh, futurist said, there are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We are all crew. And this is a ni an issue that none of us can escape and that we're going to have to confront and begin to think through and deal with the fact that we are now, like it or not, uh, in charge of managing Spaceship Earth. All right, so thank you for coming with me on this exploration of geomimicry. I encourage you to go visit us at Global Leadership Academy. Sign up for our email list because we'll be producing more videos on important sustainability issues in our research. And we have upcoming additional video series. And uh, we'll be also sharing more information on the release of the, the book, The Biosphere Rules. So please come, sign up, and we'll look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks again.